you know, this is where critical thinking comes into play. Obviously, when you speak to the medical industry itself, they tell you that only their medication will work. But what they weren't saying to me is, here are all your other options. But I stuck to my guns and I tried different things. And I went into remission a year earlier than anticipated. So welcome to the Cognitas Global Podcast. This week, I'm joined by a friend of mine. I'll only introduce her as Nadia because I have a perpetual problem with her surname. And maybe you could help me with that from the off, Nadia. Yeah, no problem. It's Nadia Duominen. And don't worry, nobody ever gets it right, ever. That lets me off the hook. Thanks so much. And we'll talk about maybe the origin of that surname in our conversations today. So as you know, this is a podcast where we try and bring really interesting people that we've worked with in the past that have slightly different careers but overlap with our own uh, work uh, into um, our sort of virtual studio for half an hour to have a discussion about mutual interests, uh, what they're doing, what they're um, doing for the future, their business, their health, lots and lots of things. Nadia, we should, I've just touched on it briefly, but we should actually deal with the origin of your surname since I do have tremendous difficulty in pronouncing it. Just give us a little bit of background on that if you can. Uh, okay, so my my surname um, is actually from Finland. I, I have my mother's surname. She's she's Finnish. Not that you'd believe it, looking at my hair. Uh, this is actually my hair color and my eyebrows. Um, but yes, I am half Finnish, uh, half Lebanese. So, hence the, the the surname first name combo. And can you just pronounce it again for me? Because I want to practice after this. Tuominen. No, that, that's not how it's. It's not spelled <laughs> like that. It is. It hundred percent is. Don't worry though. Like I say, nobody other than other Finnish people can pronounce it. Well, it's lucky I know your first name. I can pronounce that. Yeah, exactly. Nadia, we first met, I think, around 2018. We were introduced by a mutual friend, and I'm pleased to say that uh, it was great for me because we got you on board as a subject matter expert um, in your own field of intelligence analysis, as it was then. Although you've gone on to do many other things, develop many other concepts around your training. But let's start off perhaps with a, a brief summary of your interesting career. Yeah, sure. Uh, so after um, finishing with the university, um, I left UCL with a master's degree in crime science. I went to uh, the Metropolitan Police Service as an intelligence analyst. Uh, and I was there for about 10 years, um, did all the all the stuff from the neighborhood level, uh, burglary, robbery uh, kind of work on the intel desks as they were then it's all changed since then obviously things always change um through to serious and organized crime working on drugs importation contract killings um being on the kidnap rota so i'm sure many people will be familiar with that if they have done some time in the police being woken up at all hours of the morning and having to just uh, rely on copy to get you through very long shifts trying to find somebody who'd been kidnapped um very recently uh but after that Everything started to change around 2012 within policing. Again, as I'm sure many people know, there are a lot of cuts being made due to austerity, and I ended up moving on. And I went to the Tennis Integrity Unit, as it was. Um, I went as an intelligence analyst, uh, left as a senior intelligence analyst. But basically, that was the same kind of thing just in the world of tennis, investigating match fixing all around the world. Um, again, some really interesting links to organized crime, lots of opportunity to work with international police forces um, and a real chance to kind of embed some of the things I think we take for granted within law enforcement as good practice and embed them into a newer kind of investigations unit. So a lot of changes there. Um, after that, I went to the corporate sector, uh, often referred to it as selling my soul, um, which I'm sure... <laughs> Many people won't agree with if that's where they've originated. But crossing over from public to private um, was an interesting experience. Culture shock. But I went to work at Lloyd's Banking Group, uh, where I headed up a, uh, an investigations team in the commercial banking um, sector. Again, investigating money laundering internationally um, and teaching newer investigators as well about how to do that. And now... Complete uh, gear change. I'm a senior lecturer at Brunel University, uh, teaching all the new recruits into the Metropolitan Police uh, on the new pathways that they have to follow uh, to get into the Met uh, as of today uh, in 2023. 
Um, but alongside all of that, for the past 10 years nearly, I've also been running my own freelance business as New Insight Analysis, which certainly now is all about training people in intelligence analysis, investigations related to critical thinking and emotional intelligence. So a bit varied, uh, definitely a, a recurring undercurrent theme, if you like, of intelligence analysis and investigations. But yeah, my, my career has chopped and changed a bit over the years, for sure. Uh, so you went from the tennis integrity unit into the private sector. We won't maybe dwell too much on on these areas, but I think what I'd like to talk about is, um, I mean, both you and I have travelled the world delivering uh, all sorts of, uh, should we say, technical assistance, capacity building. We've been focusing around, you know, anti money laundering and corruption, transnational crime. Let's just deal with that sort of experience, I guess. Um, as I mentioned before, I've had the pleasure of. Um, utilizing you as a subject matter expert in some interesting countries i mean i think you know what uzbekistan what do you think of uzbekistan i really enjoyed the place actually when i went there i love uzbekistan it was probably the nicest surprise in terms of visiting a country for the first time i'd never been there before didn't really know what to expect um so yeah i i absolutely fell in love with the country um been there twice now with um with you well not with you it was with another sme uh with your company uh yeah thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed the experience and i love it because i learned so much from the people out there as well so you always hope to learn something from everybody around you be open to it but definitely learn a lot from the people there it was great yeah central asia i think i really enjoyed working actually amongst many other places but i found everybody to be so friendly and so mm receptive um yeah. it, it was great but of course intelligence has been one of your key core skills your career i know you've obviously delivered a lot of intelligent stuff for us but how has that sort of impacted and made a difference in your life even as, as a vocation well i still call myself and i think i always will call myself an intelligence analyst um i i will always if i'm talking or to or training intelligence analysts i'll always refer to us as we i'll always include myself in in their circle if you like whether they want me or not i don't know but it's it's i feel like it's in my heart you know that's that's part of my identity is being an intelligence analyst um there are many different versions of this job title depending on which part of the world you work in depending on what kind of sector you work in um from my perspective with the law enforcement background and it does translate across many other ones it's about identifying patterns um, either trying to predict what will happen or try and explain what has happened, where people are trying to hide um, the truth. You know, so, for example, money laundering uh, and financial uh, economic crime investigations, people will try and disguise what they're doing to get away with something. So my job was always to try and uncover that. And at its core, you could talk about lots of different skill sets that you need. But realistically, I think it's about having an open mind. Um, being able to look at things from lots and lots of different angles, recognizing the fact that, you know, we all see things differently. And the way that you get closest to the truth is by taking that into account and looking at things from all these different angles. And that has fed into my training, you know, today, my everything that I do, whether I'm teaching at Brunel, whether I'm delivering, you know, a, a, a custom workshop or whether I'm doing something bespoke, it will always be encouraging people to recognize that their view isn't the only view in the world there are multiple ones and trying to get used to being able to put themselves in other people's shoes uh, because that is from my perspective what gets you closer to the truth because that's what we're always after is wanting to succeed and to do that you need to understand what's going on and to do that you need to be able to see things from lots of different perspectives well well i guess that probably leads us on really to to something that is um you know, I've experienced myself in terms of you, you training us and our staff, actually. Um, we talk about your critical thinking skills, and I know that's been a big motivation for you, and perhaps we should deal with this first. Um, I know you've suffered, and you don't mind speaking about this, um, some quite ill health and, mm. and used your skills uh, to motivate you through this. I mean, quite often I see you on LinkedIn with your videos running around the woods in some place, terrorizing <laughs> people out walking their dog, dogs, dressed as an urban warrior but uh just tell us a little bit about your experience um right from you know this undiagnosed condition that you first started with uh hmm. yeah okay so i basically I, the, the timelines are a little bit blurry to me because a bit essentially i spent a lot of time in pain uh and anybody who's gone through serious chronic pain will know that 
life just becomes one big blur when you're experiencing it. So probably around 2017, 2018, um, I was having difficulty walking. I couldn't get out of bed. My feet were round. They were red. They were hot. My hands were hurting. They were puffy. And it was just getting everywhere. My jaw went stiff. I couldn't eat my food. All sorts of problems. Um, repeatedly going to the doctor, not getting anywhere, being told all the time that I'm perfectly all right. Um, but eventually I knew I wasn't all right. And I refused to leave the GP's office until he actually referred me somewhere. Long story short, after a few referrals, I finally get to the conclusion that I have rheumatoid arthritis. Annoyingly, because my GP had taken so long to get the right referral going, to even consider that there was anything genuinely wrong with me. By the time I was diagnosed, I was in quite a bad place. So I was quite severely impacted. Um, and I was put on medication uh, and I was told you're going to have to be on this medication at uh, you know the highest dose we can give you probably for the rest of your life. And here are all the things you now can't do. Uh, here are all the side effects you may experience. And it was just a complete, it was a complete shock. Um, a, where, where did that actually leave you emotionally at that stage then? Because that must have been absolutely awful, really, because you're still a young whippersnapper, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, no, the two, two main emotions. One was relief, because finally I knew what was wrong with me. I understood it and somebody acknowledged that there was something wrong with me. You have to understand that for months, I felt like the medical system, if you like, was telling me it was all in my head. So it was a relief to have somebody say, no, you have something very fundamentally wrong with you. But that was coupled with probably shock, dismay, fear, because then you discover, although you know what's wrong with you, it's not curable. And the only thing they have to treat it or the it's a long story, but let's say the only thing they have to treat it at the start is um, it's a chemotherapy drug. So it's not like taking, uh, you know, a, a painkiller. It's it's really quite serious. Um, and unfortunately, I did suffer all the side effects that they say are really rare. I, I suffered quite a lot of them. So I, although the medication helped me and I was able to walk and run and like you say, get out into the woods dressed as an urban warrior, I could do all of that again. At the same time, I was really, really nauseous all the time. I couldn't eat hot food. I couldn't bear the smell of hot food. It made me feel sick. My hair fell out, not all of it, but about half of it, which is quite traumatic. Um, yeah, and lots of other little side effects. So it was a really, really, really challenging time. Um, but it's those skills that you mentioned from my intelligence analysis world that helped me get through that and get to where I am now, which is a lot fewer side effects, a lot less medication, and a lot more of a well-rounded, well-balanced life, I suppose you could say. I, I remember seeing you, um, pro probably not at your worst. Um, I think the worst side effect for me, as you know, I'm a amateur magician and always grumpy when I showed you magic tricks, which I attributed <laughs> to your illness rather oh, than anything yeah. else. Yeah, um, I on that. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, seriously, you I know you battled through it um with a tremendously brave face. Uh, but let I mean, let's talk about maybe where you are now and let's talk about that critical thinking, where that came into your recovery, really. And now what critical thinking has meant for you and where you've taken it. Yeah, sure. I mean, it was absolutely fundamental to me guessing where I am now because it's a really difficult one. Um, and I think perhaps everybody this will resonate with everyone, especially if you've lived through the pandemic. There was this thing of, do you listen to the scientists or do you not? You know, there were two very um, differing camps about how you should think about things. And, you know, this is where critical thinking comes into play. At first, I default to the experts. Right? So when I'm diagnosed, I listen to the experts, the medical experts who tell me this is what you need and this is what will happen. Right. But what they weren't saying to me is here are all your other options. It was this is your one option. And that's never right. There's never only one option in life. Life isn't like that. So I made it my mission to go and explore all the other options from the completely balmy or seemingly completely balmy to other realistic natural remedies and things like that. And I decided to systematically try all of them to see whether or not something would work. Obviously, when you speak to the medical industry itself, they tell you that only their medication will work. Now, nothing else will work. It's all ridiculous. It's all placebo effects and hokum and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I stuck to my guns and I tried different things. And I eventually worked out 
that there were there were natural ways that can live alongside the medication without causing too many issues that should help me. And they did help me. And I went into remission a year earlier than anticipated. And I've managed to reduce my medication to such a low level that theoretically I shouldn't be on it anymore. I've tried coming off it and I'm not ready yet. Um, but that's down to being able to think critically and say, right, yes, I'm listening to the experts. Yes, they have a point, but they are one body with one point And I need to look around me and manage my emotions as well, which links to the whole emotional intelligence thing. Um, manage my emotions to be able to calmly assess what's going on and make sound decisions based on all the information I've gathered. And that emotion side of thing, stress was so important to be able to manage, not just because it influenced my thinking skills. Um, you know, if you're stressed, you're not going to be thinking as clearly as if you're not stressed, but also because it would give me a flare up. So I literally have an internal uh, system now that lets me know when I'm not all right and when that might be affecting my thinking skills, because my hands and feet, if I get stressed, they'll still have a flare up and I'll still wobble a little bit. Well, I can probably assess your wellness when I see you next time do a magic trick, uh, your response as to <laughs> what do we know? Um, so let's just talk about, look, first of all, let's give an unashamed plug for your company and your website, because, um, you know, as I say, I'm not only pleased to utilize you as a subject matter expert uh, for my own company, but you run some exceptional quality courses for your own. So your company is called? Cool. Uh, I trade as New Insight Analysis. And the main reason for that is because no one can pronounce my surname. So I needed a trading name. <laughs> no, I can understand that, definitely. <laughs> um, so it's newinsightanalysis.com would be your website. I take that it. is correct, yes. How about that? That's some analytical skills, isn't it, on my yeah. part there? Very good. So my, hypo my hypothesis was correct in that instance. Um, and just tell us about, so let's talk about your critical thinking course for <laughs> and how that came to be and what that means and what you do and who you delivered it to. So I... Um, run a workshop called Food for Thought, Thinking Skills in the Modern Age. Uh, quite a lengthy title, but it encapsulates what it is really. Um, it came about because two things, one being uh, what we've already discussed. So my use of critical thinking skills when I was working through my health condition and recognizing how transferable those skills are from the world of investigations into any world, everyday world, your life, your well-being. That was point one. Point two was we were at a point where social media had really taken off. And I I, I still am. I'm, I'm on social media. Um, and a lot of my friends are, a lot of people I grew up with. And it was like watching a change in all the people around me, where suddenly people were sharing a lot of misinformation. People that I look at and think, hang on a minute, you are a, you know, you're a smart, sensible logical person and yet I'm watching you here on social media sharing all these links to all this absolute <laughs> garbage and I spent a lot of time going around saying no 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 that's not true it's a hoax look let me show you and I thought what's going wrong um and it, you know that's where the whole thinking skills in the modern age came from I started to reflect on pre-social media pre-internet life versus where we are today how things have changed why they've changed that way and it all ties into critical thinking all ties into thinking skills so I thought right I've decided this is an important topic, so I'm going to launch a workshop. And that's really how it was born. And obviously, I've delivered it to you and uh, quite a few of your staff, uh, lots of intelligence analysts within um, police forces up and down the country. I've got one coming at the end of uh, next month again for another police force and their intelligence analysts. So definitely the biggest uptake has been within policing, I think, because they get it at the moment more than other sectors but it's, the interest is definitely growing elsewhere as well you know i know you delivered it to the private sector as well and it's yeah. certainly a course i'd recommend for people even though it's generated a whole staff that want to challenge me and <laughs> think critically about stuff all the time so do i blame you for that no of course that's how i want my people to think um exactly. welcome but, to debate exactly yeah and it was a great course i mean we spoke didn't we about fake news and all the other stuff and mind decluttering and some really really good stuff and as i say you know great value for money i recommend it to anybody thank you and you're moving on though not satisfied with doing that course you're now moving into thinking skills and emotional intelligence i hear the rumor yes. mill says 
Yes, that's true. So I've just launched um, another CPD accredited workshop, this time focused on emotional intelligence. So you mentioned mind decluttering. Um, that was a session that is, it is a session that is in the thinking skills workshop. Um, and it was the one that resonated most with people. I think everybody enjoyed that session the most out of the whole day. And mind decluttering was all about the things that you can do to disengage really from, um, from thinking in order to improve your thinking skills. As contrarian as that sounds, you need to switch off to be able to give your brain a chance to function as well as it can. And realistically, that links to emotional intelligence. You don't switch off by doing something you dislike. You switch off by doing something you enjoy. And it's that idea that recognizing how you're feeling, much like I need to recognize if I'm feeling stressed, because that will have a direct impact on my health. Everybody needs to be slightly more conscious of how they're feeling in any given moment. And not just that, but also be able to harness the power of it. Because if you're if you're feeling stressed, potentially that could adversely impact your thinking skills and you don't want that. So how can you mitigate that? Or perhaps you thrive when you feel happy. So how can you make yourself more happy overall? It's such a uh, an important topic, I think, especially when combined with thinking skills um, for anyone, anywhere. Who's your target audience for this? I mean, I know it's good to say every anyone, but I mean, primarily, where, where are you looking to uh, offer these courses? Well, it's it has been designed with um, investigators and analysts in mind, but that's across public and private sectors. Um, and I've already had quite a few inquiries from the private sector, actually, before the public sector, which is interesting. It's a new one. Um, but it's really for anybody who is... Um, either new to the concept of emotional intelligence or they have a general understanding of it. Most people's understanding is they hear emotional intelligence, they think Daniel Goldman, and that's about it, really. And they know Daniel Goldman's model. There's so much more to it. Um, and when you learn about all the more to it, you can start to figure out how it resonates with you and your life. And that's where you can really start to develop your own emotional intelligence and your um, your toolkit, if you like. I always call it a toolkit, suite of tools that help improve your emotional intelligence. Um, but it's for anybody who feels like if they get overwhelmed by emotion, then it would be for them. Um, if, if they feel detached from, emo from emotion, again, it's an opportunity to take some time out and explore that. So when you're running around the woods, mm. causing chaos, to all these dog walkers and people that just want to go about their business, having a nice quiet walk on a Sunday, um, do all these ideas come into your head during this time or what? What? Because I, I joke about that, but you've really taken your fitness level uh, to another well, to another level, haven't you, in, in terms of oh. your, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to see another word, your fitness level to another plane. Some, yeah, another plane. Thanks for that help. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, you've improved your fitness level, I think <laughs> it's fair to say, uh, as part of your rehabilitation process yes. from your diagnosis. Yeah. Um, actually, I've got a great marketing idea for you. Now, instead of running around with that rucksack full of stones, could you have maybe a sandwich board on with your 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 courses on either side, perhaps advertising? Maybe, but... Though saying that, oops, not the mic. Saying that, your first course, the title's too long to fit on the sandwich board, of course, it, isn't it? So it definitely is. And the other drawback is I I deliberately pick areas where there won't be too many people with their dogs, uh, and I'm I'm I am surprised if I encounter more than three or four people on one of my runs or my hikes. So it might be a wasted opportunity. And I might get stuck in a few bushes as well if I can't get through with the sandwich board. Well, so now you know why I'm not a marketing person, actually, <laughs> uh, I guess. So So what does the future hold for Nadia T then? Who knows? I, I never know. Um, and that's, again, one of my kind of uh, mantras of life. You, you know, you can plan if you want to. Uh, but realistically, I go by opportunity. Doors are open. I'm always looking to meet new people, seize new opportunities. Um, could I be doing the same thing in 10 years' time? Yes, quite possibly. Could I be doing something completely new? Yes, quite possibly. I have no idea. I just follow opportunities as they come along. Um, and I suppose it keeps life interesting because you never know what's around the corner. I think as long as you're willing um, to engage with people and you're happy to kind of leave your door open, then things will come your way. And as long as you're ready to take them, then who knows where life will take you. I think I can predict your future, actually. Oh, with a magic trick? No, not a magic trick. Okay. 
don't start me again with magic tricks. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm where you where you was when you were diagnosed. I'm in that place with now with me and my magic tricks with your responses. No, I m- my prediction for your future is in September. I think you're going to be in Skopje, Macedonia, at some stage. Oh yes, yes indeed, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! You didn't even need a magic eight ball for that one. Uh, not at all, actually. And in fact, yeah, just to just to uh, add some context to that, we're delivering a series of um, vocational pathway learning courses for investigators in Macedonia. And you're going to be taking your thinking skills, your emotional intelligence skills and your critical thinking skills. And just I mean, just revisiting that again, joking aside, I mean, you know, traditionally, you know, policing hasn't really embraced this style of training, has it? But when we've delivered it internationally, it's been very, very well received because nobody is is looking at these skills and passing on these skills, um, particularly around the leadership type stuff as well. I mean, it's been very well received. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to to getting back out there in September, um, meeting new people again and experiencing another culture. And Skopje is a very interesting place. So I think uh, with all of that, um, it's been a very interesting half an hour for me. Uh, you know, I've always been a very big fan of your uh, training and your training skills and your style and the courses that you deliver. I'd wholly recommend that people go to the website, which is called at newinsightanalysis.com. And there you will find it's a lovely website, actually. Do you make the website yourself? Oh, no. <laughs> I definitely don't have those skills. <laughs> so you're not that talented then? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, it's a great website. It's got all of your, has it got the latest courses on the emotional intelligence course on? Yes, it does. Yeah, with brochures available to download. Great. Well, um, I suggest that everybody goes and has a look at that. If you're interested in learning about how you can improve your critical thinking, how you can appreciate emotional intelligence and improve your thinking skills. But I think with that, Nadia, I'd like to thank you very much for being a guest. It's been a great pleasure uh, to listen to your story again, although I'm very familiar with it, but I'm sure it's going to resonate with many people out there in terms of those that are recovering, some great tips, and those that might want to improve some areas of their thinking, uh, understanding of emotional intelligence and critical thinking. So we'll look forward to seeing you in the woods. <laughs> God, that sounds weird, doesn't it? With that, uh, <laughs> well, hang on, look, you've, you, you said that you and I have been to Uzbekistan twice. And what do you think my wife is going to think when she listens to this podcast? I corrected myself. I corrected myself. It's, the damage has been done. I guess the papers have probably already been filed as we speak. So um, anyway, uh, it was a fantastic time with you in Uzbekistan, I remember. So. Oh, dear. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> I'll see you again soon. Always good to chat. Take care. Bye.